Okay, hello everybody, good morning. Welcome to our webinar, Demystifying Solar, um, hosted by Green Economy in partnership with Bean at Zero. My name is Catherine Burden. I am the Business Development Lead at Green Economy um, and your host for the next hour. Today's webinar session uh, is being recorded. Um, in terms of the rundown for this today, we've just got some short introductions um, before we move straight into a panel discussion. There'll be time for questions at the end. Um, I've got a slide to show you how to um, put questions in and then we'll have some final words, but we're hoping to finish at one o'clock. So today's webinar uh, represents the first in a series of webinar sessions that Green Economy are hosting to help businesses better understand um, and to build confidence in some of the key technologies that are going to help drive forward our transition to net zero. Uh, for those that aren't aware or familiar with Green Economy, uh, the webinar today represents just a very small um, part of a wider suite of services that we offer um, to businesses. Uh, and those services are there to really support businesses to reduce their carbon footprint and help implement measures to to further decarbonize. I won't go into all of those um, bullets there, um, but just I guess the key points are really that the support is available to businesses of all shapes and sizes, that the services that we've put together are there to support businesses across the whole journey for net zero from the start to the end. Um, a key part of our offer is to make sure that where we can identify opportunities that local businesses and installers and green tech businesses are benefiting from those opportunities and where possible we want to make sure that clients engage with uh, local businesses. And that these services, if you're based in Greater Manchester, are free at the point of view. So if you're not aware of Green Economy and you haven't engaged with us before, then I do encourage you to make contact with uh, a member of the team following the webinar. So why solar? Um, the solar power industry has experienced a lot of growth over the last year. Uh, data taken from MCS, um, which is certification body for the sector, um, states that over 130,000 PV systems were mounted on UK rooftops last year. I think incredibly that figure is um, more than the total of the the systems are mounted in 2019 through 2020 and 2021 combined together. So what's driving this growth? Well, there's a few things that we can point to. The main key factors are um, the obvious uh, high increases that we've seen with energy prices as a result of the uh, Russia invasion in Ukraine. We've seen production costs of solar panels uh, reduce. Um, estimates state it's, it's um, gone down about 60% since 2010. And there is an increased demand um, from businesses and homeowners looking to um, install solar PV. And that's largely partly because of the energy price crisis, but there's also a shift now in people's um, um, desire to be more sustainable and to move to uh, net zero. So in terms of benefits for those businesses that do take up uh, solar, uh, this isn't an exhaustive list and there's uh, many more that I guess we'll be covering in the next hour. Um, but highlights really are um, that businesses can now benefit from an improved return on investment. Payback is now less than five years. Those that do invest in solar can uh, look forward to more energy security. So they've got reliable source of energy uh, through their on-site renewable generation. And last but not least, it can support uh, their net zero commitment. But... <laughs> This all sounds great and there's lots of opportunity within solar, but um, when businesses are looking to move to solar, it does uh, lead to a lot of questions and a lot of confusion in the marketplace. So really businesses need to, um, before they take the plunge with solar, need to make sure that this is the right decision for them, that there is a business case in place and that sufficient due diligence has been done. Um, and really it's a long, the best long-term investment for, for them. So joining me today, I've got a panel of experts that are going to help guide us through some of these questions and hopefully more to help um, improve your understanding and build your confidence of solar um, so you can hopefully start on your solar journeys. Well, I mentioned before about questions, so I think there's an option for people to, to add questions in, so that's just showing you where to do that. I think what we'll probably do is take questions right at the end, um, so please pose the questions all the way through, but I'll try and cover those off at the end for you. Okay, 
So before we start uh, hitting into the questions, I just wanted to introduce our panel of experts. So I'd say they're all experts from various elements of the supply chain. Uh, Stephen is not able to join us today, but we has been um, Kez is replacing Stephen today. So Kez, do you want to kick off? Just um, give us a bit of yeah. an introduction into yourself and, and Cast yeah. Renewables, please. Sure. So Cast Renewable Energies is a, a project management feasibility and uh, installation company that, in, that installs energy reducing uh, technologies. We've been around since 2014. Um, I'm the managing director. The, we're based in South Manchester. The kind of technologies that we install are things like um, solar panels, energy storage, um, electric vehicle charge points, energy monitoring, ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, LED lighting, etc. Uh, because we do seven or eight products, we're able to cherry pick the best fit for for any given scenario. Uh, it's not one fits all. It's it could be a variety or it could just be a single a single piece of tech. Um, so yeah, that's us. That's Cast. Thanks, Kez. Uh, Gareth, can I move on to you? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, yes, my name's Gareth Simpkins. I was an environmental journalist for sixteen years, but last year I moved to largely run. Uh, media relations for the Trade Association Solar Energy UK, which I'm enjoying tremendously, I must say. Great, thanks, Gareth. Uh, Shane? Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Shane Wilson. I'm the Head of Sales for Pilot Group Energy Management Solutions. Um, the core of our offering is a, an energy management system um, which has a track record of reducing gas consumption of industrial heating by on average 43% across the 4,000 odd installations that we've done. Um, we've developed a lot, uh, that product a lot to turn it from a, uh, an exceptional control of gas heating systems into a light building management system. So effectively now uh, our customers can control anything that's on an electrical switch within their business. So we find ourselves controlling the regular um, big heating uh, energy consuming items from air conditioning to um, uh, compressors, that sort of stuff that are going on within our um, businesses organisations. Um, our customers were asking us and born out of our customers asking us throughout lockdown and now the energy crisis, you're doing a brilliant job for us on gas but actually we make things using electricity what can you do to help that um, we've developed a, a, an investment grade energy auditing um, service where we'll uh, go to a business we'll do a full energy audit of the site one of the recommendations of that might be our energy management system but out of that generally comes uh, quite a lot of operational and behavioral change that the business can implement for themselves um, and as well uh, the recommendation of things like solar uh, energy monitoring and that sort of stuff with uh, associated to business cases for doing so. Perfect. Thank you, Shane. And last but not least, Tim. Yep, thank you. Uh, my name's Tim Rastel, Chief Technical Officer at NSPET Power. Um, NSPET Power and an uh, electrical engineering company focusing on grid connection and power quality. Um, we do this through system studies and consultancy um, to help people get grid connections, assess power quality, assess ongoing power quality issues. Um, and also through the design and manufacture um, of power quality solutions such as harmonic filters, power factor correction, point on wave switching solutions. Um, and, and part of what we do do is supporting large energy users to develop solar installations on their site, do the grid connection um, and, and address any of the power quality issues that come along with that. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move into the questions now. Um, We've, we're going to take the approach of trying to follow through the journey um, that a typical business may need to do um, when they embark on a solar journey. So, Gareth, can you kick us off by just giving us a bit of a, a 101 then? What is solar technology and sort of how does it work high level? Thanks, Catherine. Well, very simply put, and this is just keeping it to the very basics for the moment, solar energy turns sunlight into usable energy. So most commonly, as we see today, that's in the form of electricity. There's also older but still perfectly functional technology that uses the sun's heat to produce hot water. So that's solar thermal, but I'll come on to that later. Now, when discussing solar, it's important to remember that there's more to solar power than solar panels. Solar comes as a system and it can be cross-connected to other systems such as battery storage and heat pumps. But on to the basics again, panels, Fixed, generally speaking, fixed to a roof, whether that's flat roof or um, inclined. They will then be connected to an inverter, 
which turns the direct current like you get from the battery into alternating current that we'd see used in everyday life. Um, and then from the inverter it goes into a junction box. Um, generally speaking, and this depends on an awful lot of factors, a typical installation for home, for example, rather than a commercial installation, will cut bills by about a third. But the vast majority of solar installations these days also include a battery, as when the sun shines isn't always when the power is most needed. Uh, adding a battery to cuts bills by uh, about, so, so adding a battery cuts bills by about two thirds in total. And solar power also works very well with heat pumps, which of course depend on electricity. Now, we're talking here really about commercial installations rather, about, rather than small scale residential installations. Now they occupy a, a mid range between the domestic, which is a few kilowatts, maybe you know, six, eight, 12 pounds, something like that. And the very large, and between them, the very large solar farms. So the range is um, from several kilowatts up to even approaching a megawatt on some very large warehouse roofs, for example. Uh, in terms of the of how do you actually go about it? First of all, you find an installer. Uh, one route is to going through um, our own website where you can find members of First Solar Energy UK. But the very most important thing I would advise is making sure that any installer is registered with MCS. Uh, MCS stands for the Microgeneration Certification. Um, um, was it, uh, was it, that's the SBIT. Forgot what the SBIT is. That's pathetic. Scheme. Yeah. Scheme. Scheme. Sorry, stupid me. <laughs> Brain failure there. So um, MCS <laughs> are the standards body for the sector and make sure that any installation is up to scratch. I would also urge uh, everyone listening to me to read our corporate buyer's guide. You can simply find that by looking for corporate buyer's guide, Solar Energy UK on Google. One thing I would caution is you may have to wait a while because there is almost a pretty much unprecedented demand for solar power at the moment for somewhat obvious reasons. And of course, Catherine elaborated on that earlier. So you might have to wait a while. I wouldn't uh, like to give any particular time, just that uh, it's not going to be um, instant. It's not like dialing up an Uber, as it were. Yeah, um, I, think, I think definitely some of the uh, possibly installers on the call might be able to answer um, some more, provide some more detail around around that that part yeah. of it. So one thing I will add is on the, on the solar thermal. Um, yeah. Using the heat of the sun to produce hot water is a very, very common thing. You don't see it so much in the UK, but uh, in parts of the Middle East, uh, Israel, for example, it's on almost every home. Um, it's also uh, has been really of critical importance for keeping uh, many swimming pools in the UK um, above water, and yes, pun intended, because of the uh, exorbitant gas cost of uh, gas these days. Uh, and also, uh, one thing I'd add is that solar thermal works very well, even on cold days. Yeah. So it is something you might want to consider depending on your own needs for a uh, commercial application as well. Yeah, OK, that's great. Thank you, uh, Gareth. Pleasure. So just moving on to um, thinking about planning and feasibility then, Tim, if I could come to you, can you give us a sense of um, sort of the to do list that a business may need to um, start to put together when they're looking at sort of some of the feasibility uh, and assessment um, for solar on their site? What might they need to do? Yeah, yeah sure. So um, probably if I focus on the the electrical grid connection side of, of that process um, and then I'll, I'll pass to to one of the other attendees to, to handle yeah. the mechanical feasibility side. Um, so it effectively starts with something that's called a, a G99 application. So effectively, you're looking to connect solar in parallel with the network. So you're, you're looking to be a parallel generator um, and they require you to fill in. It's pretty simple um, application form that's basically stating the size of the solar installation you're looking to install and um, how it will be made up from the inverters, the panels and um, where your grid connection point is and how much power you would be looking to export to the to the um, the grid at times when your your demand on site um, is lower than the solar that you're actually you're generating and um, so you're effectively saying what, what you're trying to do with the installation the grid will then look at that and advise if they can accept the the solar installation in terms of power export 
um, or fault level um, contribution because by installing solar you do change obviously the, the dynamics on the network you're exporting power where you wouldn't have before um, and you are slightly increasing the fault contribution um, so at that point the network may come back and say yeah it looks great go for it um, and they give you the approval to, to move on with the install um, there are some cases where they don't have the network infrastructure to accept extra power export. Um, in those instances, they'll require you to do something called a G100 export limitation scheme, um, where effectively you're installing another piece of equipment um, that monitors your solar installation and actually prevents it from exporting too much power back to the network um, if they're not able to take that power effectively. Um, so that's kind of one consideration if, if the financials that you're working on do assume that you're going to get you know good payback from selling excess electricity back to the network and um, if there is a g100 export limitation consideration it obviously changes the math a little bit um, and then from there depending on the size of the solar installation there are different requirements um, so if it's less than 800 kilowatts and um, it's pretty simple once you've got your g99 agreement and um, you've gone through the g100 um, yes or no um, you effectively then do your installation and do some some witness commissioning tests um, if it's 800 kilowatts or above, um, which is already discussed, that's quite a big installation, maybe for big warehouse roofs. Um, there may be a requirement for you to actually do some G99 simulations where we're actually modeling your solar installation and checking that it complies with network um, constraints, um, as well as looking at some other kind of system studies um, in terms of harmonics and voltage fluctuation on the network. Um, but that's only, like I say, for the installations that are 800 kilowatts and above. Um, and then from there, again, the process is similar once you've ticked all those boxes. Yeah, OK, so let's just move to Kez then. So from a um, so they're looking at the feasibility of the panels on the roof, then what's your what's your approach with that? I know we might loop back to to Tim to, yeah, to join the dots on that. Tim, Tim covered off the early stages of it really quite well then. Um, once, once all that paperwork's in place and the uh, and everything's been done, we we would perform an on-site survey. We'd physically go down to each of the, or the premises or each of the premises, and we'd be looking at stuff like um, the, the the condition of the existing wiring, um, the space available, um, you know, anything like asbestos reports, root, you know, structural surveys for roofs. We once we've got we've gathered all that on-site information, we, we then put it into our software back in the office. The, the software is based on, on Google Earth, so everything's to scale. We, we then model the building. We model the, the panels on the building so we can see how many we can get on there. Um, and, and, and from there, it's, uh, it's installation after that. But initially, it's, it's looking at the physical aspect of it from our point of view. And are there any limitations that businesses should be aware of? Like, can you put solar across the whole roof or...? You, know, what? you can, you, yeah. I mean, you can do. You, you obviously want to avoid uh, roof lights. So any any types of uh, asbestos roofs are quite difficult now. Really prefer overclad. But if something's been overclad, then we, we, you've already taken up a lot of the tolerances the uh, existing roof can take. So we've, you know, you've got to have a structural survey for that. But in terms of putting solar on the roof, we really do rely on uh, structural surveys to 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 lead the way, really. Okay. So just so I'm clear then, so would the work that Tim set out, then that would be the first stage that a business would need to do to get those those forms completed. And then that cares that you'd come in then after that once they're in place. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, what, what Tim was describing then, you know, it's it's sort of intertwined between between me and Tim, really, I suppose. It's, you know, we don't know what size of, of PV system we can potentially get on the roof just purely because we need to model it first. Um, you know, the issue with a lot of roofs in the UK is, and especially manufacturing with big, you know, decent roofs, is their consumption is far higher than the amount of panels they can get on the roof. So going back to that, you know, how much of the on-site consumption can we satisfy? That's what's pulled out in the feasibility study, but the feasibility study is based on a, on a site survey as well. So yeah. it really is, it's, it's really, you know, it's dovetailed together. Yeah. And does that build in considerations around growth that a business may be planning for? So future growth into, I don't know if they've got additional sites yeah. or. Yeah. Or... Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly multi-sites uh, from, from you know our point of view, we've got a nice contract at the moment with uh, 
it's got 90 sites around the UK. Um, and like I said before, not one technology suits every single one of those sites. It's a combination of, of solar, voltage optimization, or batteries, or LED lighting, or energy monitoring. So it, we, we kind of cherry pick. We offer we offer three or four feasibility studies to the client, and they get to cherry pick you know, the, the most suitable one for them. Um, they can obviously go for the best return for, for stage one, and then they can phase the, the rest of the stages in. Um, you know, over over a matter of months or years, it doesn't really matter. It's just lo- as long as it suits their budget and their um, journey to net zero. Yeah, and so one thing it... I'd like to come in at, on actually is uh, yeah. on the grid issues more generally. Um, for uh, for the benefit of the audience, the um, the UK's electricity grid, uh, both at the uh, high voltage transmission level and lower le- and uh, lower voltage distribution level has suffered from chronic underinvestment for a very long time and is in a pretty decrepit state. This means that the more um, the larger the solar installation, the more of an impact it can have. So in some cases, and in, 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 it's especially so in some locations, it is impossible to connect a substantial solar installation at all without making major um, upgrades to the grid in terms of transport, in terms of transformers, for example. Um, The upshot is that waiting times in some cases can last for years. In fact, long into the 2030s in certain cases. And in some cases, similarly, um, you might seek to have a installation of dozens of kilowatts for example and in one case that i'm aware of um, it was restricted to 3.68 kilowatts now that's an extreme example but to caution um, everyone people listening there are issues with um, chunk larger scale particularly larger scale commercial installations around the uk and in some cases they are not going to be able to be installed remotely soon. Fortunately, the government is aware and there are proposals for um, getting these upgrades to the grid done far more quickly because they are trickling out and it's an absolutely absurd situation. It's scandalous to tell you the truth. Yeah. So is that, Kez, is that, are you finding similar things with your clients then? Is there a typical sort of time scale that yeah. this is uh, looking at? So, I mean, typically, if you do your G99 application, you know, from from them saying, you know, we, we're going to we're going to install this and they, they turn the purchase order over. Once we write to the DNO, then you're looking at between six and eight, sorry, six and 10 weeks for a response from the DNO, ENW Electricity Northwest um, to say, quite rightly, yes or no. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the time it is a yes. If it's not a yes, it's a yes with conditions uh, and conditions exactly what uh, what Gareth was talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, the export limitation, which we've had to put in, um, depending exactly that, depending on the infrastructure behind, you know, in its transformer level, street level. Um, or there's a third option where they come back and say, yes, you can do it, but there's going to be a, a you know, small upgrade, perhaps to the transformer, say £1,500. So it's not, a, we haven't come across any no's yet in, you know, in the almost 10 years we've been doing it. Well, not too many anyway. It's it's a yes or it's a yes with 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 conditions. Okay, bro. Um, just moving on to installation then. Um, Tim, do you want to talk us through um, installation from your side of things? So, what a business from, might sorry, want. Sorry, was that me? Was that aimed at me? Yeah, you can do yeah. that one on installation. Yeah. So, so I'm looking just to understand. Just give the um the audience just a sense of what they might expect from an installation point of view so how long it's going to take is it disruptive yeah yeah what the I mean, process is how, like how long it's going to take is a really difficult question to answer it's very much dependent on the size of the system yeah. it's all very yeah. very weather dependent as well we've just come out of you know a really rough few months with high winds and very you know wet roofs slippy roofs and um, so it's difficult to answer but um a typical installation let's say commercially of 50 kilowatts it's going to take around about a week uh in terms and and that's you know that's a week with no business interruption at all um from from the moment we get there 
we've got scaffolding up, we've got edge protection up, we've got plant equipment there, we liaise all the time with um, with a management team that's looking after the installation from the client side to agree, you know, best best process and you know best way forward, least interruptive. Um, and then, you know, predominantly we're on the roof. We're, we're not we're not in we're not in the business. We're actually on the roof uh, for the, for probably 80, 80, 90 percent of the time. Um, from there, we just we bring the cables down, we bring them into the into the plant room or the electric room and we connect up the inverter. Quite often, the inverter, at the plant room is away from the main business. So we're really not impacting the uh, the core business at all. Um, yeah, I mean, 50 kilowatts is is uh, 140, 150 panels now, something like that, uh, and about about a week in total to uh, to install it. Uh, residentially, a four kilowatt system, which is which I think is 12 panels now, you're looking if it's just a solar system itself, you're looking for a day. Uh, if you're looking at solar and battery, you'd, you'd be looking at two days. Okay, great. And in terms of, um, I mean, we've talked about delays around um, the grid side of things, but are there mm. still delays around supply chain disruptions or anything like that that, that businesses should be aware of? <laughs> yeah, it's it's challenging. Um, I don't know how anybody else has found it, you know, with, with their experience, but the supply chain is better than it was six months or, or certainly 12 months ago in terms of getting the um, the product into the country. There's not really a massive issue there, you know, rather than months and months and months of waiting, it's, it's weeks now, which it, which normally falls within a shorter time period of the DNO coming back and saying we can do it. So we can preempt with our wholesalers, you know, we, we potentially have got this. What are your stock levels like? So we can we can gauge it in terms of uh, installation times. Um, there's the normal issues of, of courier issues, et cetera, and things not turning up right. But the way that we've had to alter the way we do things is that when everything is delivered to either our warehouse or onto site, we, we do a full site audit of those products to make sure that actually everything is there. And if it's not, then it's it's changed or reordered or, or ordered again to prevent any, any business disruption as much as possible. Well, there's going to be two issues at play, I would have thought. One was... Uh, simple demand having shot, gone up through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing a lot of puns today. I only apologise. Um, <laughs> of, uh, of late, um, as uh, Catherine explained. Another was uh, you mentioned 12 months ago. The the uh, a lot there was uh, serious issues about getting solar into the country due mm -hmm. to uh, Chinese COVID restrictions. Yeah, you know, whole cities being pretty much un put under lockdown. Yeah, and that was a very uncomfortable time because demand was starting to spike mm -hmm. and supplies were um, limited. So waiting times were going going up. And of course, that caused a lot of aggravation for customers because they'd made orders yeah. that couldn't be fulfilled. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Exactly. We're in a fortunate position where we've got um, a number of accounts with the, with the largest of the uh, UK's wholesalers. So, you know, between them, they, they have tens of thousands of panels available. Batteries are still a little bit tricky, but you know, as long as everything's sorted out ahead or in advance, then it's not too much of an issue. Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, regarding batteries, there's a, uh, I should have mentioned a VAT issue. If you're installing a battery system at the same time as a solar, a solar system, it's not subject to VAT. However, if you retrofit a, baby, a, um, a battery system to an existing solar installation, it is subject to VAT. This is um, a silly situation. The government's admitted it's silly and it's mm -hmm. intending to change it. It put out a uh, call for evidence on um, amending yeah. that rule uh, it, uh, the week, week before last. And hopefully that will change to at the next fiscal event, which would be what, October or perhaps um, April next year. Yeah, and that's residentially as well, not commercially, by the way. Yeah. Great. OK, let's move on to costs then. Um, so I don't know who wants to kick off, but uh, the questions around here, are, we talked a little bit about return on investment and obviously um, production costs are helping to drive down um, and the increase in energy prices, obviously helping to uh, improve the return on investment, which now um, is five years and less. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in on that as to some of their experiences that they're seeing with their clients. Yeah, I mean, I, I can jump in just very quickly. Um, yeah, absolutely. Definitely below five years. The best we've seen is 18 months. 
Um, and that was you know quarter million pound install. Um, that's just because of the paying such a lot for the kilowatt hours. Yes, it's yeah. coming down again, um, but it's it's we're not going to see the likes of of sort of 17, 18, 19 pence again. It's going to settle around I think 35 to high 30 pence per kilowatt hour, uh, and then it's going to start to slowly increase as as everything does. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, solar. Low, so our average commercially is probably around about between two and three years as return on investment. Residentially, five with batteries, maybe six years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, similar to modelling we've done. Yeah. Uh, depending on the uh, on the on the system, depending what you add to it, for example, uh, battery yeah. system, depending on the size of the system, uh, the size of the house, the orientation of the roof, etc. It it would be. Five, six, seven, perhaps yeah. even eight years, depending on, as I said, on the specific kit you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tim, are there, are there additional costs that need to be factored in when a business is looking um, to invest in solar? Like, what are the other costs that they should consider? I know you've mentioned some around the, the grid application, which I'm guessing there's fees for that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the actual application process, um, if, if, you kind of submit it and the answer is a yes that that's pretty pretty cheap um if they do come back as we've already kind of mentioned with some reinforcement works or, or things that would need to be done on the network to facilitate that connection those numbers can can add up um and then if it is a if you required a, a g100 limitation that's an extra bit of kit that you need it's a little um, power monitoring relay that basically turns an inverter r2 off or scales back the export if you're, you're approaching that limit um, yeah. And then if you are in that 800 kilowatt plus realm, um, there are then the further simulations that you need to do, um, which do incur a little bit of extra cost um, for the for the consultancy fees to, to get those done. But yeah, they're, they're probably the other costs that you, you could potentially need to consider. Yeah. And in, in terms of, um, we're not touched on maintenance yet, um, it, what, what sort of maintenance plan would be recommended that businesses sort of consider? It, for for us, it varies. It depends, you know, your location. We've we've okay. we've we're putting together. A, well, we're working on um, a load of fish merchants up in Fleetwood, and they've got a real issue with seagulls. So it's kind of you know we, we wouldn't say once yearly. Yeah, exactly. You know, we've got to have a look at it, and you know, yeah. it's kind of new to us as well. We've got to monitor it and find out you know what sort of mess it's making, or um, minimum once once a year certainly you know in a normal location but if you're next to a motorway or 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 a you know a cement making factory or uh, or by the coast then we've got to you know we've got to take a view on that slightly differently and perhaps perhaps monitor it using the online monitoring portal and, and seeing how you know when throughout the year those the, the performance of the pv systems goes down okay. hey, actually uh, as uh, anecdotally um one thing i would um urge is for the use of uh it's basically to pay attention to monitoring systems definitely uh, there is one case that i'm aware of where a school's uh pv system had gone down for five years and they hadn't noticed it was wow. an inverter had keeled over wow. and okay. nobody had noticed absolutely absolutely stunning incompetence from my perspective but we've, there we've, we go. we've seen the, we've seen the same thing gareth as well for yeah. for for councils as well, where it's it's supposed to be monitored, they pay for monitoring, but it just isn't monitored, and you've yeah. got to do due diligence. You know, no, somebody company. needs to be responsible for it. Correct, it just slipped, and that's part of our maintenance package. When we do a yeah. maintenance package, you know, per annum, we monitor it, we set up parameters, we make sure that we know if that system goes down at any point, we're sent an alert. So we, you know, we're on top of it as on top of it as much as we can be. Yeah. So to give some context, that system was. Uh, installed in the early days of uh, feed-in tariffs, so more than 10 wow. years ago. And uh, the company that uh, installed it had gone uh, bust long ago, so nobody was monitoring it internally or externally. Mm -hmm. I think things yeah. have rather improved now since then. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, just a quick question around uh, how long solar panels typically last for. It's 25 years is that yeah so the, there's a performance warranty on the panels of 25 years guarantee i think it's either 10 or 15 years of actually the product warranty um in terms of solar panels lifetime outside the the, the 25 year 
um, performance warranty. There's no reason why this shouldn't last, you know, a minimum 35 to 40 years. So uh, to, to explain to participants, the performance of solar panels very, very slowly degrades due to the uh, influence of uh, ultraviolet light. Um, so after, say, 20, 30, 40 years, their performance will be significantly lower, but not hugely lower. It's fair to say, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, some, so, so, so after 30, 40 years, it would probably, I mean, ignoring technological change, it would probably make sense to replace them. Yeah, I think the, the the panels that we I mean, we use a variety of panels. If I'm honest, you know, we we, we look at the best ones at that time, just because of supply issues. But um, typically per year, you probably see somewhere between 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0.4% degradation per, on the panel. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, okay, just bringing in uh, Shane, if I can. Um, thinking about how we maximise. Um, our investment from solar. Have you got any advice of how you'd approach that with the business? Yeah, I think when we're talking about maximising our return on investment from a solar installation, we've, we've first got to address the, the energy challenges that are facing businesses. You mentioned a few of them at the start of the call. So you've got the rising energy costs, the energy efficiency, which we focus on of, of, a, business's, of a business, how it operates when it's using energy, when it's using energy that potentially it shouldn't be, is where we'd focus. Um, the environment, environmental regulations that are facing businesses and how solar can help, certainly when they are uh, potentially um, required to submit ESOS and SECR reporting, uh, a solar installation is going to make a dramatic impact on uh, commitments that you've made through that sort of reporting. So you, without shadow of a doubt, and that those levels will be prone to change as to who and what businesses are going to be required to submit those reports over the next year or so. It was going to come in this year, but they've had to push it back. So um, energy security, we mentioned one of those as well around how um, you know the more solar that you have, the more of your energy the, as a percentage of your energy consumption, the more of that is being supplied by solar, the less prone you are to fluctuations in prices of the energy market, but also potentially variable variability in the dependency of your energy supply. So there's a number of customers that I work with, garden centres, potentially remotely located, quite large uh, consumers of energy who are prone to blackouts and that sort of stuff. And solar is definitively going to help you um, mitigate some of those um, variables um, as well. And then the technological advantages of solar, you know, it's a surprise to me there to see how much solar had to come down in cost per acquisition. So, you know, it must be then that monitoring that <coughs> over time, um, you might get a return on investment from replacing some of your solar panels. But in terms of overall, if we focus on the, the energy efficiency side of things, the starting point for us and probably the starting point of, a, of an installation of solar is to obtain your half family electricity data. You know, Kez, uh, any of the guys on this call doing um, the quotes for solar and the desk based feasibility studies can't do that really without the half family electricity data. And whilst you've got that as a business, I think it's really, really important that businesses take a step back and start to analyse that, start to produce the half hourly averages of well, what, is, what am I consuming on average at half 12 on a Monday morning when my business is closed? And how does that relate then to what I'm using when I'm actually in production? And if as a rule of thumb, it's not between 10 and 15% of what you're consuming within production, you've got a considerable um, uh, challenge there to find out what it is that is actually consuming that energy and draining power when you don't want it to. To give a few examples there, um, there's a couple of businesses that I've worked with where their 24-7 operation, uh, the only day that they're really closed as a business is a Sunday and one of them is spending quarter of a million pounds a year on electricity um, on a Sunday when they're not actually making anything. Uh, and literally that was down to just poor operational um, and, and management of uh, shutdowns on site. So by switching things off, we'd saved a quarter of a million pounds worth of electricity and therefore the return investment from a solar array is going to be vastly improved because if the actual energy profile of the business is much smaller. So as a percentage, they're going to be using far more of the electricity from the solar than they would have done previously. I think the other thing to add is that solar, certainly within this country, when you look at most solar profiles, they're absolutely fantastic during the summer when we're really sunny. During winter, obviously with less daylight, those profiles decrease. So by making the business more energy efficient um, and reshaping the profile of the energy consumption means that certainly in the winter period, which is 
or the periods of time that are going to extend the um, the return investment for your solar by reshaping the the, the energy profile. Um, you're going to minimise your energy consumption in periods where you just can't generate the solar um, that you need um, to, to to provide to to the business. So. First, firstly, to me, as, as a guide for anybody that's on this call that's not done it already, get hold of your half hourly electricity data. Um, if you want to, I can help you put that together. There's no charge for that. I'll do that anyway for, for our customers um, to make some sense of it. Uh, and then from there uh, comes out actually, well, yeah, you know, what is it? The, the questions will come out of what is it that's draining power at? six o'clock on a Tuesday when our business is shut um, and it will start getting you asking the right questions around energy efficiency. If that makes yeah. sense. It's an important point in energy efficiency needs to be tackled uh, 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 you know first and yeah. foremost before we start to um, invest in on-site uh, generation really. Um, yeah. yeah. It absolutely does. Um, and generally, most people, certainly in manufacturing, where, um, as I mentioned before, that it, it's very rare that you would see somebody be able to, to take away uh, all of their electricity consumption, certainly during the summer periods of the manufacturing process, because we tend to be quite energy dense uh, with not the, the, the appropriate amount of roof space. Um, certainly doing that exercise of energy efficiency and looking at the operation, it could be something as simple as, you know, the lean practitioner on site has said, well, to make our things as quickly as possible, when you go for your break, just leave your machine on. And actually yeah. working out the business case, of, well, that's 10 kilowatts, that's machine at 92 pence per hour, that's nine pounds 20, that is just cost to run a lunchtime, times five for, for times yeah. five for your working week, times yeah. or 250 days a year, all of a sudden for one machine you've got an immense amount of cost um which can be taken out of the business just by switching it off yeah there's lots of so, low-hanging fruit isn't there that can be addressed yeah. i think before pumps especially <laughs> pumps are very easily neglected yeah um pumps so you know, the upgrade of pumps you, know, you can get a return investment i did one for an upgrade of um pumps and a motor in a lift motor in a lift was particularly astonishing really when we looked at it you know, spent forty two thousand pounds a year on lift running costs and actually we could get that down to seventeen thousand pounds a year just by upgrading the motors from a grade two to a grade three um so you know the, there's there's huge amounts of low-hanging fruit to be found and i think um when it comes to the the other ch the challenge that we mentioned there the technological advances is really it's everybody on this call's job to help our customers guide them through well, what is the highest priority out of all of these things in terms of the low hanging fruit what provides you with the best business case um to, to go ahead with it whilst you're doing something like a solar because without doubt um solar ticks all of the energy challenges that that we've mentioned there in terms of uh, putting a sticking plaster over energy efficiency tackling rising energy costs all of that sort of stuff solar is going to really really help a business and it's going to buy you some time whilst you look to make your business more energy efficient and, and as i say in in the meantime um you will be able to take a return investment that maybe you had originally from your solar and recalculate that down quite considerably with some fairly um easy decisions to make from a from a uh, an energy point of view and cheap ones you know, it doesn't cost anything to switch a machine off yeah great thank you shane that's that's really useful i was going to suggest that we move on to the questions that are in the chat um tim if i could come back to you because there's a couple around some of the points you were making uh, earlier on so um first question with reference to long lead times on g99 dna process for large pv systems what if the premises will not export is this process required 900 kilowatt pence on the roof but 1.5 megawatts per hour demand yeah yeah so you still need um to go through the the g99 process even if you don't intend to sort of export power back to the network because you are still classed as a generator operating in parallel with the network um, so the power quality considerations and making sure their infrastructure is, is suitable for that still needs yeah. to sort of be considered. Um, so, yeah, that would still be the same sort of process. Yeah. OK, I, I do understand that some uh, DNOs will not accept export um, limitations. Yeah, it does vary from DNO to DNO. Yeah, yeah. Can households install ground, sol ground solar without MCS certificates if the installer does not have one? You don't need MCS to be able to install residential. Like Gal said, it is a standard though. Yeah. Um, but It's you know, a sign you, of a quality you, installation and I wouldn't go near a non-MCS registration with a barge pole. It's a, it's a minimum standard. Um, yeah. 
you okay, know, yes, but not recommended. It that. used to be required for uh, to obtain feed-in tariffs, but that went out the window in 2019. Since then, uh, it's not been a legal effect. It, it was a de facto legal requirement. It's no longer a legal requirement, but it is strongly, 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 strongly recommended. Okay. Um, have installers come across businesses sharing the cost of insulation, etc., by utilising shared adjacent roof space? Is it practical to do this for both the installer and the customer? Each, I mean, anybody can jump on in this, but in our experience, that each customer has their own meter and their own MPAN number. So, you, yes, there might be shared roof space, but um, only only a, a, portion, a proportion of that roof space. Um, we'll be able to go down to the down to the meter, down to the MPAN, which is that's directly linked to the the G99 application. So yeah, I mean, if you've got five or six um, units together, all with different meters and MPAN numbers, then you might find that when you do your G99 application, is that because you're all having them, you know, next to each other, that might reduce the overall capacity. Your, your availability on the network. So again, it refers back to, yes, we have a look at your consumption, we interrogate your HH data, we look at your modelling, we look at your roofs, see what you can get on there and then see what percentage the on-site generation versus the uh, on-site consumption. And then we then you need to write to the DNO to say, this is what we want to do. And then they come back and say, yes, yes with conditions or no. Okay, thanks Kez. Um, just looking on here. Uh, so, Gareth, I think this one might be for you. Question relating to the VAT point raised earlier. So, VAT element removed purely for the battery or the whole installation of PV plus battery? Sorry, I didn't quite get that. You broke so, up there for me. So, was the VAT element removed purely for the battery or for the whole installation? Uh, it hasn't been removed PV yet. It's like, at the moment, as things stand for residential installations, if you put in a battery at the same time as a solar system, the battery is not subject to VAT, neither is solar. OK, if you retrofit a battery to an existing solar system, it will be subject to VAT. However, within a year tops, that situation will be resolved and the battery will no longer be, be taxed as a, uh, when retrofitted. OK, thank you. So we see a lot on social media with pretty looking roofs, lots of PR on the green credentials, but the data seems to be less forthcoming. Granted, it takes time, but are there any data sets which are live or can go back three years or more to see financial carbon impact of projects? Anyone aware of any existing data that any of our delegates well, could I'm, look I'm at? I'm actually starting to put together a series of case studies, but yeah. uh, we've only really got three so far and have, none of them have been published. I'm looking for far more. <laughs> We've got case studies of our installs. Um, you know, when we do our, our feasibility studies before we do the uh, the application and install, it, it talks about um, CO2 reduced, you know, the amount in trees saved, etc. Um, the online monitoring platforms that we use also have those indicators on as well. So we, we can quite easily check on the online monitoring platforms about you know how how it's performing and, and the co2 that has been saved yeah we can do that now, of course uh, manufacturing and transport for, for solar systems have their own carbon footprint but that's uh taken care of uh within months in some cases is for maximum this is old data now but i think old, old data about a year and a half but i have seen data is claiming three or four months so either way, it's a very short carbon payback period. Yeah, OK, um, thank you. So um, what do the panel make of shared ownership models like Ripple, Ripple Energy, come across oh, them? Well, Ripple made a big okay. announcement, uh, recent, uh, was it yesterday, about uh, buying, a, uh, buying a solar farm. So is it, Ripple is basically uh, you get uh, a crowd in investment from the public to buy a solar farm and buy its power. So it's uh, essentially a, it's a power purchase agreement sort of situation from that. Yeah. Um, but I think it's uh, the question is also kind of touching on, on um, community energy as well, of which I know quite a lot because I'm a director of Croydon Community Energy. So I've been involved in 
uh, negotiating um, uh, commercial um, solar uh, purchase and, and, and purchasing as well as uh, as well as the day job and as well as organizing a residential installation for myself and a battery and air source heat pump and all sorts. Ah, sorry, I kind of got distracted with the question. What was the question again? It's, <laughs> it's all right. It was about Ripple Energy. I think I wonder if Shane had something to um to come in on. Yeah, I think, I think uh, if a business doesn't have the capital um, uh, expenditure to to go into a solar um, relationship, or um, they potentially might get an improved return on investment by going in or with varying different businesses on uh, a solar, it can be quite a useful concept to do. Uh, the reality that I've seen within businesses, however, uh, is mixed, um, largely due to um, the lack of a preparation and documentation around what's actually happened. Uh, but then, you know, businesses that we operate in are quite, quite dynamic. So the person that's generally steered that um, shared ownership model, i.e. somebody else owns the panels or it's leased roof space or whatever it might be, has left the business and then the knowledge about that thing has also left. So it can be a really useful tool, but I'd say if you're a business that's going to go down that road, uh, you have to doc document it really, really well. You've got to make sure that it's somebody's responsibility um, within the business to manage that moving forward um, so that that knowledge base continues as the business changes or grows or people come into the business leave that sort of stuff because otherwise it very very quickly if people leave and that knowledge is not transferred um then it you, the business generally struggles to find out who it is that they need to speak to with regards to either repairing solar panels or whatever it might be there's two or three different businesses where i've got that case of i think one of them actually guinness the brewery on their panels so they found themselves actually ringing guinness the brewery when one of the panels was when the solar yes. wasn't working because that was literally the only contact that they had so if you're going to do it uh, it could be a really useful tool to spread some of the costs and help um mitigate some of your energy through solar but make sure it's really really well documented and that you've got a very very clear handover process with whoever it is that's managing it should they leave yeah can i okay can i just can i just add to that very quickly because i'm aware of time yeah with the, with the ppa as well uh if somebody else owns the system then you may have roof issues as well you, you know they're leasing the roof off you um but also if they're owning the pv system they're taking the lion's share of the financial uh, gain from it so you need to look at that um, I mean, with, with reducing return on investments from PV systems now, we work with a number of really, really efficient green lenders that can make it cost neutral over a very short space of time. So I would, I personally, and this is you know my own opinion, would steer people away from a PPA and into into a, into towards a green lender because you could you could pay for the system in three years and you've got the benefit for for twenty five. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd yeah. concur with that with Kez from the customers I've seen. You can actually pay for, for some of the schemes I've seen, you can actually pay for the financing yeah. and still yeah, have exactly. overall a net, a, a, a net decrease in costs yeah. um, out of the financing and your, your solar. Uh, yeah. I would definitely concur with that. Okay. Um, there are a few more questions, so we may not get time to answer all these today. Um, just a quick one from... Um, Helen here. So, do any as installers know the CO2 footprint of the panels that they're installing? It's any it, work being done on that? Yes, it has been done. I don't know it. And um, the reason why, I mean, it's changing all the time. China is, you know, the worst country. All, all the module, the majority of the modules come from China. If they're not assembled there, the, certainly the cells are, are made there and transported somewhere else. Um, but the actual, you know, particularly Shenzhen is, is, the, is the, the city where most of the, the panels are made, except for inverters. And that's becoming more green all the time. Um, so the CO2 footprint for the panels um, being produced or the inverters being produced is reducing constantly. But I, I don't have a definitive answer for that, I'm afraid. I mean, yeah, there are. I've seen a lot of different estimates and ultimately it depends, although uh, I know that you know the head of chat that did uh, express some scepticism about what I said earlier. There was I've read one one study which was I think based on an installation in Singapore, so obviously not the UK, and it did conclude that the carbon payback was I think three or four months. Obviously, that's going to be different in different places, and depends on the on the manufacturing technologies all all sorts. One thing I would stress because we mentioned China, is that. Um, 
the world has recognised that strategic reliance for a critical technology on one country is not terribly sensible. So uh, the Western world in particular, and also India, are you know, have expressed a great desire to expand their own manufacturing base. At the moment, there are no panels manufactured in the UK at all. There's but other other kit, for example, fixings, etc., certainly manufactured in the UK, um, but no panels themselves. Uh, but that will be changing by the end of the year because there's a company called Oxford, uh, was it Oxford, is it Oxford Renewables, Oxford Solar, I can't remember now, uh, that have their own manufacturing plants and their panels are uniquely efficient because of uh, their own patented technology. It's about 20% um, higher efficiency than a standard um, average panel. Great, that's good to know. Um, I just let me just ask one more question and I think we might need to wrap up because we are over time. Um just interested to hear the panel's views on um on solar windows, so for commercial or residential. Had, has anyone come across them or had experience with them? I've seen them. Um Not installed the them. yeah, no, 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 none whatsoever. I think the efficiencies are so low. Um I just don't think it, it'd, be, it'd be a vanity project. Um if I'm slightly rude about it, uh, the, the return would be would be minimal. Um, okay. So no, not something we looked at. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's a reason why these things have taken over the world. Yeah, the, the, the price per performance just doesn't particularly make sense. Yeah, yeah. I'd Correct. say if you, I'd say if if people are in the public sector where there's not an unlimited pot of our money to spend, but the initiative is purely around uh, carbon reduction, then potentially it's an option because the business case wouldn't be very strong, but the carbon reduction would be quite useful potentially. Yeah. OK, um, thank you to everyone. I think we do need to wrap up. I was going to suggest that um, each of the panellists could just, um, if you could offer one piece of advice to businesses as they start their solar journey, what would it be? Yeah, just quickly though, Shane, do you want to go first? Look at the data while you're doing it, get the electricity data out, monitor that like a hawk, make it part of the conversation of your business. But to echo what Kez said there as well, once you've got the solar in, use that as part of the data set that you're monitoring as well. Because um, certainly with the half hour electricity, you won't find out the answer to all of your energy efficiency problems. It will start asking you, uh, getting you to ask the right questions of yourselves and the business to make yourselves more energy efficient. So on my part, it's I'd say if it's under if your installation's under fifty kilowatt, make make absolutely sure that it's uh, registered with MCS. Okay, Tim, what about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say to ensure to use a uh, you know an experienced uh, installer and our consultant to support the project, and um, so they'll know when you need to do things. Because you know if you have someone that's not experienced, they'll miss something, and you can have the system. It's not authorized. You have big delays. It's really important that you've got a very good advisor on your side. Yeah, thank you. And Kez, yeah, it's it's data driven. You've got to look, you've got to interrogate the data. You can do, uh, looking at the data, you can implement some either free measures or very cheap to do measures before you start installing the technology like, like we do. We've mentioned, obviously, this has been about solar. That will look after 30 to 40 to 50 percent of your energy of your on-site. You know, commercially it will do. Um, but what do, you do, what do you look at? How do you decrease the bit of um, energy that solar won't satisfy? And that's something we can look at as well. So it's day.